Welcome to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. I am Dr. John, the guide for your heroic journey towards greater health, success, and most importantly, happiness. And now, on with the show. Hey, all you avid listeners out there, this is Dr. John. And if you enjoy what you're hearing on these joint podcasts with me and my fiance, Jory Rose, please know that we are offering a week-long retreat in Costa Rica in April of 2023 at one of the top resorts in the country where the body workers are next level and you will learn from myself and Jory how to be in better relationship to yourself, to your loved one, and to everyone else. This is going to be a once-in-a-lifetime experience experience. Please feel free to check out the podcast notes for more links, details, and info. Thanks so much. And now on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. John back with the latest episode of The Evolved Caveman. And today I am truly excited to have with me Lloyd Roberts, a dedicated husband, father, and serial entrepreneur who loves business and investing. And before he co-founded a tech unicorn, a company with a billion-dollar valuation, Lloyd had many ups and downs as an entrepreneur, with each new venture teaching him lessons about what to do and perhaps more importantly, what not to do. Lloyd has been nominated for several entrepreneur-focused awards. In 2021, his tech company was recognized by Inc. 5000 as the 21st fastest growing software company in the country. In his recent book, G Cubed, Lloyd champions the idea of living an intentional life where life happens for you, not to you. He hopes to inspire others by sharing his journey and discovery of a personal fulfillment formula that can be used by anyone to become truly fulfilled. Lloyd, welcome to the show. How are you? Doing great, Dr. John. Thanks so much for having me on today. Absolutely. My pleasure. So tell me a little bit about your story. Share with us, how did you come to the point of writing this book? Yeah, great question. Well, uh, for the last 20 years, my two brothers and I have been serial entrepreneurs and uh, candidly, most of the businesses didn't pan out, right? Uh, That's how it works. <laughs> it is. But oftentimes we learn from business three, some things we needed to know to launch business four, to solve new market problems and to to take the, the profits from one and roll them into starting the next one. So business has been a pr- uh, primary focus for the last 20 years. And as as we finally... One quote unquote in the business world. <laughs> um, it's it, it's been an interesting process, right? I, I thought for over a decade that having a certain size of a bank account would check that personal fulfilled box, right? Mm-hmm. Fought real hard for it. There was a time that didn't quite know how I was going to afford diapers for the the two sets of twins. Well, and Lloyd, I mean, that's funny because I, I think that's how we're taught. That's how we're socialized, right? That if you make enough money, then you'll be happy. I agree. Yeah. And I've, I've and worked with a lot of men that just have found that it, it's not true. It helps, but it kind of yeah. it can create more problems as well. Yeah, it's just different problems. I and mean, people think of money and they think that it's going to solve all the problems. And you know, there's all kinds of jokes and songs about it. Of, uh, money doesn't buy happiness, but it can buy a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Different things of that nature. And, and it's true to a certain degree, right? The, the first dollar that comes in the door, you need those first dollars to create some stability in your life, to put some food on the table, to, to you know, make sure you have air conditioning and you have a, a, a place to sleep that you're not getting rain on your head, things of that nature. So those yeah. first dollars are most important. And But after, after you have enough of those first dollars, those second dollars allow a little bit of comfort and a little bit of additional opportunity. Right. And so maybe you can now order DoorDash sometimes and you can you can drive a car that you're not worried about breaking down today and things of that nature. But at a certain point, when you exceed that, now everything is just luxury, right? Can I fly first class? Can I do that nice vacation? Can I eat that expensive meal? You know, things of that nature. And that last dollar just isn't as valuable as that first dollar. But when we're when we're young and we don't have a large bank account, we think that it is it is ever perpetuating that, oh, wow, I know that that second dollar created a more ease and comfort and opportunity in my life. We think that it's that it's ever growing. I can I can promise you that you know that twentieth million dollar is not as valuable as the nineteenth, and the nineteenth wasn't as the eighteenth, and so on. So money really, when after you've checked those first two boxes, it's simply just a magnifier of who you already are. If you're a bad guy, you just have more to be bad with, right? Maybe you just mm-hmm. want to do everything that's self-centered, and from you know 
checking all of those uh, boxes of having you get instant gratification, right? I want the big yacht. I want the the beautiful fill in the blank, right? I want all these things and I'm going to use money to get it. Or money can be a great magnifier of for good, of spreading uh, a message or helping lift individuals out of poverty or education, whatever it is, it's a magnifier. It's a, it's a megaphone for whoever you decide to be. Yeah, I, I like that. I think research backs up that idea of first, second, third dollar, that we need the first dollar. And you know, you can debate the amount. I've heard it pegged at 80,000, 100,000, 120,000 per year to meet basic survival needs, depending on where you live. And yeah. then after that, the money, the additional monies that you earn above and beyond that don't add as much to our personal fulfillment or life satisfaction or happiness. Or I should say it takes like a factor of 10 to one in order to get the same boost that $1 would give you on the front end. You're right. There's diminishing returns, right? But the cool thing is it might be a diminishing return for me. Let's talk about that 21st million dollars. Okay, great. You know, did it change my life? If you have a 20 million bucks and you go to $21 million, well, I would argue that nothing really changed in your life, right? But to somebody else, imagine even in very extreme scenarios, third world countries, what could be done with that $1 million? Well, it goes from your last dollar to maybe the first dollar for somebody else. And so mm-hmm. it can have a, a major impact for someone else if you choose to, to be a conduit for light to flow through and if you choose to give in an intelligent way. I, I like where you're heading with all this because I've seen a lot of men that are worth a lot of money, you know, 20, 50, 400 million dollars that are miserable. And I believe a big part of why they're miserable is they don't have any meaning or purpose in life. Yeah. And what you're talking about here is your meaning, your purpose, it sounds like. Yeah. And, you know, back to your original question why did we write, why did I write this book? Right. And, and my initial question, my initial belief was when I had a really fat bank account, you know, eight, nine digits, that would check the box and it would allow me to do and be whoever I want to be. And it, as nice as it is, it really checked box number one and box number two real well. Box number three wasn't nearly as fulfilling as I thought it was. And then to add to that, I have a younger sister that had a terminal illness and she survived for quite a while and she passed away about two, three years ago. I'm and a young mother that. with a, with a, a couple of young sons. And, you know, the we didn't know when she was going to go. She lasted longer than a lot of people thought she was, was going to. But at the same time, when she did pass, it's like, wait a minute, this took you? And all these, these dozens of things that already happened before when you're hospitalized and these crazy things are going on, you survived through those, but then you passed in your sleep one night. And as tender of a mercy as that might be, I reflected on the the years before her passing and her struggles were high and she physically felt ill most of the time, but yet she was happy. She was fulfilled. And so I, I felt like, you know what, there has to be a predictable, repeatable formula to that anybody, regardless of your background, your race, how wealthy you are, your whatever the differentiators are that society tries to lean into, isn't there a formula that anyone could use to become personally fulfilled? And and uh, so I started diving into you know all the Jim Rohns and Tony Robbins and this, there's some pretty good stuff out there, mm-hmm. but it was like I was going to a master chef, which they are, man, they got their stuff together. And I, they had made a beautiful cake and it was delicious and I could, I could smell it and it was, and it was beautiful. And then I said, Hey, you know, I want to make that cake. Well, they talked about sugar and they talked about flour and they talked about all the cool things that you could do with salt and all the ingredients. And then I felt like when I said, Oh, great. Well, you clearly know how to make a, a delicious cake. I want to make that cake. The, the, the undertones were, were, well, everybody's a different chef. Everybody needs to cook a different... You need to figure out how to mix all these ingredients for yourself. It's a unique experience. And that didn't resonate well with me. And I thought, you know what? If, if someone's done it in, in the business world, I'm in the software world, and it's all about a code. It's all about processes. It's all about th- doing things that are predictable and repeatable. But yet in the personal fulfillment world, I wasn't finding the formula. And so I went on a hunt to find out what was the formula, right? What was the recipe? I didn't want to just know all the ingredients that you needed, but it's different. If you're, if I'm going to 
plop on your list, uh, a list uh, on your plate, a list of ingredients to make a cake, but you have no idea how long to cook it, or do you mix in the chocolate frosting at the very first step, or is that after at the very end when it's cooled off? Right? There's an order. There's there's rhyme and reason to to making a cake, and uh, my belief was there there had to be some rhyme and reason to the ingredients, how you mix them together, how long you bake it, and and what you finish with to get that end result that we're all looking for in this life of personal fulfillment. So that was my journey that I went on for a couple of years right after my sister's passing. And then it came to me that there is actually a formula to becoming personal fulfilled that cuts through the clutter and cuts through the noise that all you need to do is focus on three things. And we, and we call the formula G cubed, the only formula that you'll ever need for personal fulfillment. Uh, so you can find the book on Amazon. You can find the, the audio book on Audible. Um, and that's, this is the introduction of a, a simple and repeatable formula that you can use to increase your level of personal fulfillment. Yeah. And, and so the, the three G's are gratitude, growth, and giving. So let's go a little bit in. And I know you've got a seven step process, but just from the, the surface level of gratitude, growth, if that's growth mindset and giving altruism, yeah, I can totally get behind all three of those. Yeah, well, thank you. It's uh, you know, I had a friend that when I originally brought this up to him, he he kind of thought about it for a minute and looked to the side and said, "All right, I I can get behind these." You know, if anybody has elevated levels of gratitude and growth and giving, even if they might be missing the mark in other directions, I can see how that is a fulfilled person. But I think that uh, so I, I love that. But I think that our default, our unconscious formula is to sum these together, much like when you went to high school, right? Let's, let's pretend for a moment that you only had three grades on your report card. You had an A, you had a B, and a C. Well, you innately know, okay, I'm going to add those together and divide by three. And what's my GPA? It's a 3.0 or a B average, right? And so... I think our unconscious minds do that same thing. So let's let's put some numbers to it. Let's say in your own world, wherever you are in the world right now, put a number to it. If you're amazing at, at gratitude, give yourself a five. And if you're okay or average at gratitude, give yourself a three. If you're horrible, give yourself a one or anything in between those, right? Low score is a one, a high score is a five. And then you do the same thing for growth and, and then the same thing for giving. So let's pretend for a moment that somebody is a, a four in gratitude, a four in growth, and maybe, I don't know, a three in giving. Well, they would add those together. Four plus four is eight plus three is 11. 11 out of 15. Okay, I got like a B minus, right? But the problem is my... I would submit to you that that individual that has a level four, four, and three, that they actually don't feel like they're a B minus level of overall fulfillment. Now, if you are, if I look at you and say you're a four and a four and a three, I can understand how you would be a B minus level fulfillment. But something for some reason, it just doesn't work for me. I don't quite feel like a B minus. I feel worse than that, right? Mm -hmm. Or let's take another example. Let's say, let's say somebody is full of growth. And by the way, growth is different than success. Success is the byproduct of sustained growth. And if you don't sustain that growth, that success, like a wake to a boat, it'll end up dissipating over time. But focusing on a growth, it could be planting a garden, it could be reading a book, taking a class, learning how to play the guitar, whatever growth is to each individual, it's progress in one way or another. But let's pretend in this example that somebody has high levels of, of growth. There are five. Let's pretend that they also have high levels of giving. Giving isn't just your, your cash, right? It could also be your time. It could be your talent or your treasure, right? And at different phases in your life, you'll have different ways of giving. But let's pretend that someone's a five in the giving category as well. They're donating their time to the university on their area of expertise. And let's pretend that the same person in the category of gratitude, they're two, right? They... They get cut off on the freeway and they want to get in a fight with the person, flip them off and call them, call them names. They get home and they're thinking about how their spouse is, doesn't realize all that they do for them. And their kids didn't come up and say, I love you, parent. And they're so in, ungrateful for all the things that this parent's doing for the kids. And this is the mindset of the individual. So they have a five in growth, a five in giving, and a two in, in gratitude. 
Well, let's add those together. Five plus five plus two is 12 out of 15. Okay, a B or B plus level of overall fulfillment is what the summation formula would say. Well, let's turn it on its head because this isn't the summation formula. It's G cubed. And we innately know if you got a big capital G and a little three to it, to the power of three, that there's an invisible multiplier in that formula. Call it what you will. Call it grace. Call it mother nature, the universe, God. I don't care what title you tie to it, but there's a multiplier, a magnifier that wants us to become more, right? The objective of this life, I would submit to you, is not a life of ease and comfort that we are so often sold since we were very, very young. As soon as fill in the blank, then you will, ah, that's, that's what we're right. sold. As soon as you can retire, then you can kick it on the beach. As soon as my kids are out of diapers or out of grade school or, or, or. Out of the, the house. <laughs> yeah, out of the house. Then, <laughs> then I can relax. And that's when I've obtained a life of ease and comfort. And that's my objective, right? And I would submit to you that it's not about obtaining a life of ease and comfort. It's about obtaining a life of growth and progress and overall fulfillment, and you do that through not the summing of these numbers, but by the multiplication of these numbers. So let's do the multiplication for a second. Okay. Okay. Five times five is 25 times two is 50. Well, no wonder this person is miserable, right? If somebody's rich, attractive, successful, giving all the time and ungrateful, well, what kind of life do they have? Well, they have an ungrateful life. Right. But what if this same person that only got a 50 and it's not intended to say you suck, right? It's intended to say, Hey, have we identified an area in which if you, if you put in a, an ounce of effort, you can actually receive a pound of results. And with the multiplication formula of G cubed, we can see, ouch, no wonder you feel like you're flunking, even though you're growing and giving, you're still miserable because you have 50 fulfillment points and you need 100 to become truly fulfilled. Well, what if this same person increased their gratitude from a two to a three? What kind of impact would that have? Well, it moves them from an F to a C. What if they moved it from a two to a four? Well, they just went from an F to truly fulfilled. Now, sure, there is an opportunity to move it all the way to a five, but perfection is not a requirement to be truly fulfilled because it's unlikely that you're going to remain a five in all three categories anyways. You'll work on one and another one will adjust. So it's a balancing act of raising your G scores in these three categories. So Lloyd, it sounds like what you're, the, the formula kind of accounts for the negativity bias in the human mind. So without training, the human mind naturally overfocuses on the negative, negative thoughts, emotions, self-definitions. And yeah. we've found in, in research that that negativity bias is somewhere between three to five times as powerful as our focusing on the positive. And, and I often talk about ways to counterbalance that negativity bias. And I, I think you can do that with focusing on gratitude, growth, and giving. Yeah, a good call out. It really does. And you know, it's sometimes, I mean, let's start with the first one, gratitude. And it's first on purpose. It's kind of hard. Let's let's call it out for what it is to say, oh, I choose to be a grateful person, right? Because we innately feel like we're being a bit hypocritical, right? I sh We feel like we should be, if we are, if we feel grateful, then we'll express gratitude. But if we don't feel grateful, then expressing gratitude is phony and fake, and I'm therefore phony and fake, right? So I get it. That's a, there's a natural uh, aversion to doing so. So what I've I had some men tell me that it feels Pollyanna-ish. <laughs> That's a good way to say it. It just it just feels. I'm like yes. So does happiness. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're right. So we do have the power to make the decision. The power of choice is so much more powerful than any of us give ourselves credit for. However, if you don't want to just say, flip the switch and say, hey, I'm a grateful person. Well, I have a solution that, uh, that I invite anyone to try. And it is this, although offensive to some, it is to root out every single entitlement that you have. Every single one. All the money that is in your bank account, it's not yours. The way that your spouse is supposed to show you love, 
No, that's not, you're not owed that. They don't owe you anything. The way the kids are supposed to show you love. The temperature of the room you're in right now, you don't deserve, you're not entitled to a comfortable temperature. It could be freezing or it could be boiling hot. You're not entitled, you're not entitled to the air that flows through your lungs or the blood that flows through your veins. Well, the other things that come to mind are our intelligence, our skin color, our sex, male versus female. Yeah. You're right. All those things. If sometimes we feel that we are entitled to them, or we feel like we got the short end of the stick in some way. And so we do what? We grab our things that we say that we're entitlement entitled to. We hold them close to our chest and we say, I dare you to take these things from me. I will fight you. And our fight, our passion for life is now focused on not losing what we consider that we're entitled to. However, I would submit to you, if you give up all your entitlements, by default, everything becomes a gift. Everything. Wow, the fact that I woke up this morning is a gift because I wasn't entitled to wake up this morning. The fact that my wife gave me a kiss, the fact that my kids said ABC, the fact that you know I have comfortable clothes, everything's a present because I wasn't entitled to it. Therefore, when I lose something in the entitlement category, it's not, it's not painful. I'm like, okay, this is happening for a reason. It's happening for yeah. my betterment. I, I actually don't think gratitude is that difficult to begin as a habit or a practice. I, I, and this was really brought home to me. I, and I totally am with you with stripping away the entitlements. I think that's yes. a, a fine approach. I, this was brought home to me when I saw a motivational speaker who was a quadriplegic who you know wheels out on stage on his wheelchair and says to the audience, hello, did all of you wake up breathing today? And the audience kind of laughed nervously, like, what the hell? And he said, because I did, and I'm grateful for it. And, and I thought that really brought it down to the basics. And I think it's fun to think about what are the things that I take for granted in my day-to-day -day yeah. existence that I could actually practice gratitude for. And, and I look at it as kind of having three layers. So there's gratitude for the really obvious stuff, like my mom, my dad, my kids, my house, my car, that kind of stuff, my clothes. Yeah. Then there's gratitude for less obvious stuff. And that's the stuff you have to kind of hunt for, like... The ability to walk on my own two legs, the ability to feed myself with a fork, my ability to control my emotions with my breath. Um, and then the third level is the it's gratitude for the biggest challenges that you've had in life. And, you know, I can say, for example, like I'm truly grateful for my contentious divorce that I had years ago because it really gave me a chance to practice the emotional management tools that I teach to others. Awesome. Really well broken down, right? It's uh, we are grateful when either we change our entitlement or we realize that nothing in this life happens to us, but that it all happens for us. And even though as painful as it is, I mean, if you want to get a, if you want to get a, a ripped physique, well, you got to do a couple things, and part of that is going and pumping that iron and ripping the muscle and filling it in with other things like taking protein and other stuff. When you said something important right there, it doesn't happen to us. It happens for us. And it seems embedded in that is the belief that everything happens to us for a reason. So even the crap, the hell that we have to deal with at times I believe happens for a reason. And I think, you know, one of the ways to go from post-traumatic stress to post-traumatic growth is to ask yourself, what am I supposed to learn from this? What's the lesson buried in this horse manure? I agree. I agree. And when when we think that the objective of life is to attain a life of ease and comfort with no struggles or problems, either for ourselves or those we love most, we are often disappointed. I mean, yeah, totally agree you might you. be able to save your marriage, but uh, that doesn't mean your child can save theirs. And then now your expectation is that this is my standard. This is how life should be, right? And anytime you think about what is your standard, what is your story? Well, if you ask yourself the question, if everything was as it should be, what would that look like? And now you know your story. You know your, you know your measuring raw. And if your life is meeting your standard or exceeding it, then you feel you feel at ease or or peace or even pleasure. But if your life is here 
or you're, you're perceived that it's lower than that gap between your standard and where your life actually is. Well, there's pain. I was supposed to be married by 30. I was supposed to be a millionaire by 30, have two ki- two and a half kids and a white picket fence or whatever the story is. Yeah. When you don't measure up to it, then that causes pain. Well, and I, I think it's, you know, a lot of that's founded on the belief that every one of us seems to have at some point in our life early on of life should be fair. And and I think, you know, a lot of this talks about shoulds, right? I should be married yeah. at 30. I should have two kids by now. I should be yeah. wealthy by now. Um, so I, I want to get to the another question and then I want to get to growth and giving. But how do we reprogram our unconscious mind to align it with our dreams, aspirations, and desires? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a really good question. Because that's it's a not fascinating easy. one to me. It is. It is. And, you know, it's... I, I live in the software world, right? And just last week, we had over 2,000 hours of our programmers editing bugs, adding features, tweaking the existing software. Well, you could argue that maybe the software wasn't that great because it's requiring so much adjustment to it. But uh, I think it's a pretty great software, right? And our, our company was just uh, ranked the third fastest growing company across all sectors in our state uh, two weeks ago. Congratulations. And- That's awesome. Thank you. And you know, it's uh, it's interesting. Why would a why would a company or a software that is doing so well require so much additional programming and bug fixes and tweaks? Well, I think that we all have we all have our hardware, right? And we, you can hold your physical phone in your hand, and you it's easy to, for you to say, "Oh, yeah, this is the hardware of my phone," and then to realize that the phone is not you. Well, we all also have our software. And the hardware is virtually nothing without the software more than a paperweight. But with the software in the hardware, you can do all kinds of things. You can click to buy, you can swipe, you can watch videos, you can research. It's amazing technology. But yet you also wouldn't consider yourself to be the software of your phone. The combination, as amazing as they are, we innately realize that that we're not the hardware or the software. But yet we're the user that they were intended to serve. Well, it's the same same case with us. We have our hardware, our bodies, and I think we all realize that we're not our bodies, even though sometimes when you you, you get hurt or something, you're like, oh, that hurt me, but you really realize it's your body. But the mind's different. We think that we are the unconscious wiring of our minds. We think that we are our, our software. And the reality is, is that our software, we came programmed in a certain way. And over the years, we've had tweaks and standards and adjustments and code of our software that have been adjusted and tweaked. But we have our what we call our standards or the software, right? And you might you might call it neural pathways, you might call it roads or highways, and you, you could get there on a bumpy dirt road that's one lane, or it could be a freeway, and technically those are both roads, but uh, one's very easy and one's very difficult. Well, how do you go about adjusting those, right? Maybe if you you have a freeway to your favorite addiction, but you have a bumpy, dirty road to get to express love to your child, and you don't really like that you have one for free, you want you would prefer for those to be reversed. But how do you even go about doing that? And in in GQ, we have a seven step formula to to walk through that process. And uh, I don't know if we have enough time to go through all of it today, but it's through the process of identifying what what you're uh, at first adjusting your state, and we can talk about that. Two, identifying what is your current G score, right? And and therefore identifying what is your low G, right? If you're a four in one category, okay. uh, three in another category, and a one in another category, well, we we know which category we're going to focus on. It's your lowest G to elevate that G. Once we've elevated that, we can work on on your next G. Then three, go ahead. Go, no, so go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that once you've done that, you've now you've identified what G you want to raise in the specific category. And there's five different categories of your life. Uh, then it's it's uh, understanding what your current standard or story is, right? And we we rarely think about this. We think it's just well, that's how it is. And there's a lot of things that we are just like, well, that's just how it is. That's law. It's written in stone. It's unmovable. But when we pull back the curtain some, we're like, well, wait a minute. Why is that my belief? You might even tie religion to it and say, well, this is the, this is the doctrine of the religion. Is it? 
Or is it your interpretation of what you've tied to whatever doctrine that might be, right? Heck, I was in church uh, not long ago when there's one person that stood up and talked about how life is so hard, but it's okay because life's intended to be a test. And the next person stood up and talked about how life was a dance and that that's how God intended it. Wow. They're using the exact same religion to justify their perspective, but their perspectives are completely different. Mm -hmm. So our standards in reality don't have, they're not tied to reality. They're simply our standards. They're our story. And so when you identify what your story is, which is not an easy process, but you can do it by just asking yourself, if everything was as it should be in this category, what would that look like? That'll tell you what you believe your story, what your standard is, and that will tell you your story. And then after you know your story, you can go through the process of adjusting it, right? Step, there's three options and that's it. Option one is raise your life to meet your standard. Maybe you are maybe you like your standard, right? This is preached from a variety of pulpits and it's very important. It's step up, make it happen, you know, go to work. And in this, in this specific case, be a man that you decide to, decided to be, right? But that's not always the on answer. It, it's commonly the answer. You need to rise to the occasion. Part of the answer. It's, yeah, it's not the only answer. There's two more potential answers. The second one is you need to raise your standard, right? If your standard is that it's okay to play video games for 12 hours a day, you're going to easily meet that standard, but that standard is not serving you. Perhaps you should, on that same totem pole, perhaps you should elevate your standard and say, you know what? I don't play video games on weekdays and the weekends I play for two hours. You, know, you can choose what it is, but you can change and elevate and, and raise that standard. And then the last option to choose from is one that hardly anyone thinks of. And it's that you can literally change your standard. And when would that even be appropriate? Well, what if your standard is, is that your child should get great grades they should go serve in the military or, you know, stay in the religion of your, of your choice or fill in the blank with whatever you cast upon them to have them be successful. Well, you've now given your power away because your standard is tied to the actions or behaviors of someone other than yourself. Well, why would we ever do that? And we do it all the time because we don't realize that we have any other options. Oftentimes, we project on others because we feel like we can't do it ourselves, especially mm -hmm. to spouses or children. So what if you change that standard? Instead of saying, my child needs to get straight A's because this is how I'm a good parent or fill in the blank with whatever your standard is. What if you changed it to something that was tied just to you? What if it changed to, I will love my child unconditionally? And I will spend an hour a day fill in the blank. So now you're in control of that. So you literally changed your story. You knew what your story was. And then the this next step is to identify what you want your story to be. But the problem is most of us don't know how to rewrite our story. For example, I'm uh, the CRO of Lone Pro. I don't know how to program. I might be able to sell the software, but I can't program. But the good news is we don't have to be programmers. Rather, we write out what we want our new story to be. In the programming world, in software space, we call this writing the project spec. And then you hand that, and the project spec is your desired new story. And then you hand it to the programmer and say, programmer, this is what I want. Get to work. And that's the next step. Well, who are the programmers? Well, they are your supporting rituals. They're the things we do. They're the actions we take. Maybe it's getting up an hour earlier and getting in state, working out, getting your blood pumping, meditating, whatever it is. It's do, taking actions that actually go into your unconscious mind and start reprogramming very specific things so that you can turn those dirt pathways into paved highways. Yeah. And a couple of things come to mind as you're talking. One is, you know, with these unconscious beliefs, it makes me think of the work of Jared Clifton at University of Pennsylvania, who's working on primal world beliefs. And what he's finding is that these beliefs underlie every action, emotion, and thought that we have. It seems it's only been five years or so, but to, to look at these beliefs, I think is extremely important. So for example, um, to what extent do you see the world as good versus bad? To what extent do you see the world as safe versus unsafe? To what extent do you see the world as alive versus mechanistic or just versus unjust? And then uh -huh. I like to break them down to people as well. So to what extent do you see people in general 
as honest versus dishonest. And think of that on a one to 10 scale. But I had a client say to me the other day, you know, I would say 20% of people out there are honest. And I was like, wow, that, that, okay. I, my belief is that 85 plus percent of people out there are generally honest and trying to do the right thing, which is amazing to me because we live in the same world and yet we live in completely different realities. Yeah. Completely different because you decided how to perceive it. Right. I mean, I would say that, that situations, circumstances, I know, I know this is hard, but that they're completely neutral. Uh-huh. They're not good. They're not bad. They're neutral. What is the difference is, is the meaning that we link to those circumstances. Now, it can be a circumstance that most would say is a very bad thing, right? There's some horrible stuff in this world, right? Rape, murder, different child dying, divorce. This is tough stuff. It's really yeah. hard stuff. However, the meaning we link to any circumstance is the emotional experience we have to it, even if it never happened. Right? Have you ever had somebody that uh, you you heard something from a friend that somebody else said or did something, right? And then you get all riled up and you have the emotional experience of like it actually happened just to find out that it never actually happened. Uh-huh. Your emotional experience was like it happened, even though it never really did because of the meaning you linked to it. I mean, imagine that you go, man, it's a warm summer day. You walk up to an ice cream parlor all by yourself, and a stranger walks up to you and hands you an ice cream cone, says something in a foreign tongue, and walks away. Okay, that's the that's the situation. That's the circumstance. But what does this odd circumstance actually mean? Well, the truth is, if if you consider it to be insignificant, your unconscious mind will link a meaning to it, and it will be an insignificant meaning, and you'll meaning, and you'll move on. Well, if you consider it to be significant, then your conscious mind will kick into gear and link something to it, right? Maybe my ex is trying to poison me. Maybe this person, Mm -hmm. that was a clever way for somebody to try to flirt with me. What a beautiful town. These people are amazing. You know, maybe I'm going to pay it forward and buy a comb for somebody else. All of that is because your conscious mind kicked in and linked a meaning of some kind. Or you have a third option, your, your I am. Not, not your body, not your unconscious mind, but your conscious ability to decide kicks in and you can then choose to link any meaning you want to it. Whatever meaning is linked, that will become your emotional experience with the circumstance. Mm-hmm. And so let's move a little bit on to growth because the growth piece fascinates me as well. I, I had a young lady ask me once after an interview, she said, can I ask you a question? I I just graduated from Harvard and I broke up with my boyfriend five months ago and I'm thinking of getting back into the dating pool. And do you have any advice on what to look for? Like what's most important to look for in a, in a relationship partner? And I thought about it for a minute and I said, yeah, actually I do. I think that the most important thing to look for is find someone with a growth mindset around relationship skills, because if you both have the willingness to learn and grow in terms of how you show up in relationship. I can't think of anything you can't deal with. Awesome. It's great advice. Uh, Growth is something that's often overlooked, right? Or it's even demonized, right? It could be like, oh, look at this person and they're all self-centered and growing and just focused on who they are. Okay. And growth is often tied to success as well. For better or worse, sometimes people people are proud of other people's successes, and other times they're demonized because they've achieved a level of success, and and then they compare against it, and they don't like the comparison, and so they'll demonize it. But uh, I would say that success and growth are very different, but sustained growth creates success. But the fulfillment isn't actually found in the success; it's just a byproduct of the sustained mm-hmm. growth. The fulfillment component, at least a third of the fulfillment, is coming from the actual process of growing. It's like a road trip. It's not, you know, getting to grandma's house two states away. It's the it's the journey of getting there. It's the conversations that you had and turning up the music and and that whole process. And to grow, I mean, imagine a road trip. Now, of course, if how much time of that road trip do you spend looking through the windshield? Right, avoiding potholes, making sure you stay in the lanes, you know, making sure that uh, you go to the gas station when necessary, all that kind of stuff. It's clearly a critical part of of this road trip to get if you have any hope to get you to your desired destination. But it's often the thing that we focus on when we talk about growth. 
But there's two other options. You also have the ability to, to look into the reflection of the past, those things that are behind you, into the rear view mirror and side view mirrors so that you can see what's going on behind you. And this can be really helpful, right? If you're going to change lanes, it's probably a good idea to, to look in your rear view mirror. If you're going to parallel park, that's a good idea as well. But what percentage of your time are you looking in the past versus looking through the windshield? And as important as it is, if you're always looking in, in the rear view mirror, that's going to be detrimental to you getting to your desired destination. But yeah, and all if I can of this, jump in there, because I, I, I'm with your metaphor, and I think that the mind naturally pulls us to the past and the future. So the rear view mirror and the windshield, I think it's yeah. also an important skill to learn to be with yourself in the car while you're driving. So Amen. in the present moment. Amen. That's the third piece, right? And it's, oh, okay. the, it's the third one. <laughs> Sorry. I think that's great. All of the joy, all of the fun of the road trip happens inside of the vehicle, right? It's that conversation. It's holding hands. It's turning up the music. It's asking questions. It's rolling down the windows and you know, seeing the dogs stick their head out. That's where the memories are made. And that is the living in the present. Now, to live in the present 24-7 might be dangerous on getting to your desired destination, right? You have to reflect in the rear view mirror. You have to look through the windshield. But the memories, the presence, the, the peace that you're going to reflect back on your deathbed someday, those are, the, those are the moments that you live in the present. Well, and I think to have some awareness also of, you know, if you add positive and negative to that rubric where... You know, are you when you look in the past, are you over focusing on the negative past, which is the domain of depression, sadness, regret, guilt, shame? When you look through the windshield and you're looking to the future, are you looking to a negative future or a positive future? Because we know from studies that 85% of what we worry about, which is the negative future, the outcome is actually far more positive than as we're worrying about it. And so I'm, yeah. I'm trying to make that distinction for people too of you know, let's see if we can spend a little more time in the positive past, positive present, positive future, as opposed to negative past, negative present, negative future. Amen. Amen. And and how do you do that? I mean, for me, my experience on how to do that is to realize that the objective of life is not to obtain a life of ease and comfort. Mm-hmm. Rather, the objective of life is to become more, to grow and progress and be that different in a year from who I am today. And how do I do that? Well, it naturally happens when I realize and believe, and this is a choice, and I'm not saying that this is true for everybody. I'm saying it's true, whatever you believe is true. If you believe that everything in life happens to you, you're right. But if you believe that everything in life happens for your betterment, even the crap, then now it's really difficult to see it in a negative light because you're like, wow, even though this circumstance is a hard circumstance, wow, maybe there's a higher power of some kind that trusts me enough to have me grow and become something more, that to stretch and to to rip my muscles a little bit because I can become a little bit more in this life. And then now it's Now it's a different way of looking at it. You're going through something horrible. It's really difficult, but now it's for you, not to you. Now you're not a victim of a circumstance. Rather, you're the victor of your life. Yeah, I, I, again, absolutely agree with you. And I like the metaphor for growth of... Because I get a lot of pushback from men, male clients on this. And what I say to them is, would you rather be a stagnant pond with moss growing on it and muck and mosquitoes, or would you rather be the raging river? What feels healthier to you? Because to me, one of the overarching purposes of life is growth. And I think one of the things I love about growth or learning is I think we get a positive emotional dump or boost from learning something new, even at the smallest level, even from getting a math problem right. Yeah. Agreed. It's a, it's a necessary thing. I mean, look, look at men that retire early. One of the studies show they die early, right? Yeah. It's because they, they, did, they worked so hard for decades in their field of, of choice to, be, to master it in one way or another, all to one day have a life of ease and comfort. And so they speed up that life of ease and comfort and obtain it a little bit early and then sit in their lazy boy and stop working out and stop using their mind to solve problems and statistically, they pass earlier. Yeah. And I tell my, my clients who are of that age, like, look, I don't mind if you retire, but we are damn well going to find a new meaning and purpose and identity for you before you do. Yeah. You're right. It's not about making the dollar. It's about having progress. Yeah. 
And, and I think we need a purpose. And, you know, for most men that work is our identity. It's our purpose. You know, we're providing for the family and that's fine. I have no problem with that, but I've seen too many men retire and like, I'm just going to go golf five days a week, but then they lose their purpose and identity and then they fall into a depression and then, you know, it increases their mortality chances. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So yeah, the last one is, is uh, giving. You want to talk about that one some? Yes. Let's do that for a few minutes and then we'll wrap up. That sounds great. I I would submit to you that uh, giving is the most fun you will ever have in this whole life, but it's not a business transaction, right? I mean, we've all had scenarios where we've given something, time, talent, or treasure, and we expected something in return. And when we didn't get that exact same thing, we we felt like we were stolen from, right? Could be, I'm going to give you an item, you're going to give me love, or it could be any type of, of interaction where I'm giving something, but I have a preconceived notion of what I need to get in return. But when you throw that out the window and you just give without pretense, no preconceived motion of exactly what you need to get back, you're literally just giving because you want light to flow in and through you to bless the lives of others. Man, that is so fun. I mean, it's yeah, a giving dip. without expectation. Yeah. It's, it's addictive. It, and frankly, it's, I mean, would you rather, I mean, the world tells us that if you're a good parent, you got to take your kids to Disneyland, right? That's cool. It's a fun experience, primarily because you can just spend so much one-on-one time with your kids and see them, and, you know, on roller coasters and meeting Mickey and all that fun stuff. Or would you rather go buy a vehicle, maybe a van for a single mother that's struggling financially, put a big red bow on it, have your kids help you make the selection of it, fill it up with gas and then drive it and park it in front of the house and have your kids go knock on the door. I mean, which one in 10 or 20 years from now do you think is going to resonate more with you and with them, right? And so it's really interesting. There's so much fun that's giving in a way that that your neighbor or your parent doesn't expect you to give or but in your unique way, in the way you're inspired to give, right? It might be sharing a kind word with a complete stranger, even though it might be a little awkward for you. It might be buying a meal for somebody or you know, using your, your capital in some way. But most of the time, it's, it's putting your phone down and being present, looking, looking your loved one in the eyes and listening to them without, uh, without waiting for a pause in what they're talking about so that you can jump in with whatever you've decided to say, but truly listening. So that's the third component is, is giving and giving without pretense. And, you know, my personal experience, this has been the most fun I've ever had in my life is trying to master the art of giving without pretense. Well, and and I, I love what you're saying, because I think one of the things that research has shown is that one of the keys to a happy, fulfilling life is self-transcendent goals or values. And that's exactly what you're talking about. It's being a part of something bigger than yourself. And so helping out humanity, helping out others, uh, could be spirituality, could be religion, could be a nonprofit, but all those things are incredibly important to help us to understand that it's not all about us as the individual. Yeah. It's so exciting to be a part of something that's bigger than any one individual, right? That improves the marketplace or has a positive impact on the world in some way. And uh, one of the things that we've done to implement the the strategies of G Cubed is we've started a public charity. Me and my two, two business partners and brothers here at Lone Pro and the culture of Lone Pro is really spilled into this. And we've asked our older brother, who is a professor at a local university, to retire and uh, stand up our charity. It's called Become More. And there's really two objectives. Number one is to increase the level of gratitude, growth, and giving among the uh, affluent. Now, you would think that that would be the 1%, but the truth is 99% of America is affluent on the global stage. It's all those that are depressed and full of anxiety and lack purpose, and they don't know how to get out of their mom's basement, and they're miserable. They don't want to be. They just don't know really how to change that. It's to help implement gratitude, growth, and giving in their own life. But one of the ways we're doing that is through helping specifically young adults become more through 
international service vacations. So we've, we're focusing in on Cambodia, and our goal is to lift 100,000 Cambodians out of extreme poverty. Well, we want these young adults to be the hands and feet and mouthpieces for Become More, to get over there and get their hands dirty and meet these people that are living literally in the dump. Hundreds and hundreds of people where their houses are made out of dump, uh, dump materials leaned up on each other, right? And going and seeing that uh, people are days away from dying because they don't have proper antibiotics and all these things that in, in the States were like, wait, wait a minute. That's, this isn't how dogs are treated in our country, but real humans are poor at a level that is hard to understand. My family and I just got back from there in July and uh, had a, a really neat experience of, of serving and learning. And you would think that this is us going and helping them, but that's, that's the secondary benefit. The number one benefit is the change that happens in us because we no longer live in our own minds and bodies, but we start just being a conduit for that light to flow through. And it's interesting how depression and anxiety and all of these things that we hold close to us of, oh, we need to have fun all the time. Let's go rollerblading and you know, all these activities, eat the best food and all this stuff. When we stop focusing on, on internal things and we start focusing on how light can flow through us, there's a, there's a real palpable power to it. So we're super excited about this. We've, uh, we've donated a, a large sum of cash to this. And we've recently had some more that donations that have flown in. It's a, it's a very new public charity, but we're super excited to lean into it, specifically focusing on young adults helping them become more through adjusting their mindsets, through believing that they have the power of choice. Well, and I think, I think you're absolutely right. That's a life-changing experience for anyone that goes down there to help and support and offer their services. It, let me ask you this. Did you find that the Cambodians living in those, I, I would call them slums, it sounds like, yeah. um, and that might be a too kind, um, did you see evidence of happiness and gratitude among them? Yeah. I don't know if you've looked at the research, but uh, Cambodia mm -hmm. was just ranked the happiest people in the world again. And it's, it's amazing. It really proves that, that America, we are rich with resources, right? And some would argue against that because that's, they, don't, they haven't seen the global right. stage. But, but comparatively, uh, it, yeah. Yeah, comparatively, we're rich with resources. Well, Cambodians in general are very poor in resources, but they're rich in gratitude. They're rich in happiness. They, they're finding fulfillment because their paradigm is so very different. So the, the goal isn't just to do something nice for the Cambodians or to have the Cambodians do something nice for us. It's for us to, to merge these two lines into a circle and have us both benefit and grow in an upward spiral. And maybe we can share some resources with them. Maybe they can share some happiness and some of their perspective with us. And we believe that, you know, the a rising tide lifts all boats, and this is our intent. Yeah, so thank you for your answer, because I, I know there's other research showing that in slums in India, for example, in Calcutta, that the same thing is true. There is um, a surprising amount of happiness and gratitude and other positive emotions, despite the fact that they have very little in terms of material objects. And I think for us in the U.S., it's a fantastic reminder because I think we're always making these social comparisons in our mind based on social media that, oh, I, I don't have the best car or I didn't get into the best school or I don't, I don't make enough money or, you know, we're always making these comparisons which make us miserable. Yeah. And I, I think just the reminder and the paradigm shift of, I don't really need all the material stuff to be happy. You're right. To be fulfilled. It's, I just need to care more about others. I agree. One of our family's very favorite sayings is comparison is the thief of joy. Perfect. I love it. Well, so if people are looking to find out more about you and the book, they can go to gcubedformula.com. That's all spelled out, gcubedformula.com. What about the, um, the charity? Is yeah, that you also can go there? to... The there is a link where you can go there or you can go directly to becomemore.charity or becomemorecharity.com to learn more Excellent. about the efforts that we're making in, in Cambodia and also to implement the G-Cube strategy. And, you know, we, we want to keep it simple, right? If it's too complex, people aren't going to do it. 
But if we can keep it simple and just focus in on on just gratitude, growth, and giving, uh, I believe that our own level of personal fulfillment will will really rise. I, I hate to use the word happiness, right? Because it's so it's so polarizing, right? But uh, yes. fulfillment is to me it, it really hones in on what what we're looking for. I, I agree. I think fulfillment's a better word in this context. I also think that most people. Um, resonate with happiness. That's kind of what they're looking for. I think most people on this planet are looking to be happier. And yeah. so they don't, I, so I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And yet I'm trying to figure out what's the best word to communicate with more people. Cause I, you know, I can go life satisfaction. I can go fulfillment. I can go joy, which is too intense of an emotional arousal. I can go happiness, <laughs> contentment. I like um, because yeah. it's kind of a mild happiness. But anyway, Lloyd, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this with us. I, I really appreciate the the work you're doing to rise up others. Like I, that's it's admirable and it's much needed. So thank oh. you for doing that. Is thank there anything that I sh- anything that I didn't ask you that I should have, or anything that you'd like oh, to add in closing? It's been a really fun discussion. I really appreciate your talk, your your topic and your target market, right? Um, it's it's an unserved, it's an underserved target market, and uh, to be able to help men understand their role and how they can elevate their own levels of of personal fulfillment as that happens, all those that these men love, they end up having elevated levels of of personal fulfillment as well. So super exciting. We also do have, I'll just note this, we have a number of G cubed life coaches that uh, are available to help you walk through the seven step uh, fulfillment process. So we're doing all kinds of things there as well, right? Some of them, uh, there's different packages you can get, but uh, we also have some free options as well because the overall objective is to help people. And awesome. that starts with us, right? If you're in an airplane and and it starts going down and the oxygen mass to drop, well, if the temptation is to put it on everybody around you. But the right answer is to put it on yourself, right? We we don't realize that. We're like, oh, let me help my daughter. You know, she needs all these things. I, I got to make sure she never wants or needs and the truth is, what does your daughter really want for you? Well, she wants you to be personally fulfilled. Mm-hmm. She wants to smile at your funeral. She wants to know that you lived your passion. And so the best we, thing we can do for those we love very most is to elevate our own levels of personal fulfillment because that's what they're looking. That's what they want for us. And that's what we yeah. want for them. I think of that. I love the uh, oxygen mask example because it points out to me the extreme need for putting self-care first. So that we have something to give to others when the time arises. Because otherwise, I think most of us are taught that we're just supposed to serve others, give to others, help out others. And many people that I've seen do that to the point of exhaustion and burnout. And so to make it sustainable, I think we got to be taking good care of ourselves first and foremost. Amen. Truly a pleasure, Dr. John. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Lloyd. And that's it for this episode of The Evolved Caveman. If you like this episode, please be sure to like, rate, and review and share with your friends. If you didn't like it, you don't have to do a damn thing. Thank you so much. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 